Welcome to Always Listing. We are your hosts. I'm Joel. I'm Jay. And we are Always Listing. And we're back together again, better than ever. I, well, I don't know about all of that. But, uh, Jay, I have been on when the road. When did this turn into Mike Greenberg? Uh, you gave me flashbacks <laughs> to ESPN radio days. Oh, my gosh. I, it's, I'm, listen, I just got done uh, last night. My wife and I caught up on Last Week Tonight with John Oliver, which is probably my favorite television show all said right now. I just like, like the combination of the fact that he entertains me so much and also does good things in the world like this week pestering the FCC with robocalls that is amazing it's it's that's a public good that he's doing to the world anyway he starts his show every time welcome 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 that's kind of how I want to start all my shows now it's very well it's welcoming isn't it Jay uh anyway before you get into that now I have to react because I too love the John Oliver I think he's very much from the same same Stephen Colbert field i've been mentioning colbert quite a bit here the last uh, couple of shows uh we on my podcast next fan up uh tried doing a news segment which we called the nfl yesterday today this week <laughs> uh so uh in a similar vein it was uh you know hats off to the uh comedians that get it I, well, it's it's good when you can both entertain and educate, right? Like it's it, you you mentioned right. it the other day. It's like, hey, he tells me the news stories that happen, the the big things in the world that I need to know about. I do at the end of an episode of Colbert or whatever, but also um, I can chuckle through <laughs> through the thing, which is sometimes exactly what you need. It's a lot of heavy stuff out there. Uh, I I had some chuckles myself, man. I had a blast. I just got back from Podfest uh, twenty nineteen. This was my I I keep I'm confused in my head about exactly how many years I've gone to this thing. I'm 99% certain this is my third year in a row. It might have been my fourth, but either way, I've been very, very lucky to be a part of this community, and it's uh, it's grown by leaps and bounds over the last couple of years. Uh, last year, I think the total number was just a little over 500 attendees. This year, they topped 1,000, uh, so it really is expanding, and they are moving to a much larger venue, is my understanding, for next year. Uh, so it'll be exciting to see how it continues to grow. And again, uh, Jay, any time a, a conference grows, the big thing is can it maintain its feel? Like PodFest, it's sort of claim to fame and the thing that I always t always tell people about PodFest when they ask me about attending, it's got a very family atmosphere, right? It feels like a community, a tight-knit community. Seems like literally everyone there knows each other, even though that's definitely not the case at a thousand attendees now. Uh, can it maintain that as it grows you know can it maintain the focus and the feel while it expands well that was going to be my question for you with seeing the size growth that i had experienced this past year i unfortunately was unable to attend uh, i had been to the previous three i believe um i missed the first one and i've been to every one since this was my first year missing since i had started going um but my understanding of the history of this particular conference is that it started as a meetup group in Tampa. Uh, and then it just expanded, 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 and then they grew into what they now call PodFest. Uh, and my understanding from the founders was that they kind of wanted to keep it smaller to have that sort of family feel. This year seemed to be different, though. It seems like they may have taken a different approach to the conference and, and looked to expand to get larger and maybe bring in some more of those corporations that we see going to podcast movement, which happens in the summertime. Well, so two things happened, I think. I think that they had done a very good, and they being John Dennis and uh, Chris Kermitzos, the founders of the conference, and their whole team, by the way, the whole team up and down the, the board has done a good job, but particularly those two fellows at the top, they've done a good job growing that feel, maintaining that uh, sort of family atmosphere and that that spread, the word of that has spread. And so what's happened is a lot of organizations, a lot of companies have heard people like me that have said very positive things about it in the past. And, and I think they've said, well, let me take a look over there and see what it has to offer. Uh, the other thing is they've this year in particular, they took much better, uh, um, What's the word? They took much better um, – <laughs> they used the space. There you go. They utilized the <laughs> space much better this year. So the hotel that they were in was already a very large facility, but last year they had a smaller piece of it, clearly because they had you know half as many attendees. Last year they really felt like they were bursting at the seams. This year – 
the space was very spread out. There were rooms that were quite, for instance, on Friday, I think I walked like 11 and a half miles. That wasn't all the conference, but a <laughs> lot of that was back and forth from room to room and from, you know, this side of the conference section to that side of the conference. Uh, but that that's really any space that's part of the problem with finding a hotel that has, you know, both great accommodations for your attendees actually when they get to their room, but also you want nice meeting areas, you want a great lobby, you want food options, you want these, you know, big Big rooms that are changeable so you can do like the ballroom for the keynote and then shut them down to smaller presentation rooms throughout the day like that's a lot to ask of any space this space was very up to the task and and again the team for podfest did a good job channeling everybody to the right areas uh next year moving to a more open facility i think it is possible again if they keep that in mind that we this is our advantage this is our sort of like differentiating factor is this community atmosphere the fact that we come out of a literally a one city meet up you know uh that origin story is good and if you can grow from that i think hey listen i go to a big church right and the reason i go to a big church versus a very small church isn't because you can worship god better in a big church it's because a big church offers cool extras that a small church can't possibly offer things like child care you know, things like uh, after school programs, things like stuff in the middle of the week, things like, you know, youth trips and everything. All sorts of opportunities come with numbers that you just can't get when you're smaller. So if you can utilize that and grow and take advantage of the things that those larger numbers offer you while still maintaining the community atmosphere, plus plus and kudos. What it'll take is focus. It'll take hard work. Um, you know, the guys switched, I think in the last year or so to a, to a 12 month model. They weren't, this was sort of a part-time thing for Chris and John until the last year or so. I think it will be interesting to see whether they can double those efforts, you know, and, and continue to expand kudos on them, man. So far, I, I love the community. I'll be excited to be there again next year. Uh, there is no better place to be than, than sunny Florida in the middle of the winter. Right? Like, I mean, so many of my friends from <laughs> right. up North were like, it was so amazing to to know that I didn't have to bring a coat, you know, that I had to take the coat when I got on the plane, but then I could put it away once I landed and never see it again until I was going to take off. And so, then so many depressed faces when they landed and had to dig their way back to their doors or whatever, you know. It's been warm here. I'll, first of all, I'll just say uh, yes. we're, we're in the 50s. It's been in the 50s <laughs> the last couple of days. It's a it's a it's a quite nice uh, winter thaw happening right now here in the Northeast. And let me tell you, you know, 50 degrees, us Northerners, we, we start sweating uh, when it's 50. So I don't want to hear it. That's uh, funny. I, I'm not jealous at all. So let me tell you a couple of things. Uh, it, it, here are my big takeaways from the conference. I didn't get to go to very many sessions. I never do, truthfully, at this point. A couple of things. A lot of a lot of the sessions are obviously more beginner and intermediate stuff, and it's not exactly for me anyway. Sometimes I go to, um, uh, you know, be there for a friend or support a friend that's presenting or something like that. But a lot of the sessions aren't exactly for me anyway. But even the sessions that would be for me. I tend to find myself needing that networking opportunity. I need to say hello to somebody. I need to have that conversation with the person I only see once or twice a year maybe. And so I I always lean into those opportunities because the the friendships and the relationships that you build in this industry, those are the ones that um well, I mean, there's there's no price tag that you can put on that stuff. Uh, and that is the stuff that's made my business possible. That's the stuff that um, fuels me. You know, I, I came back and I just, my wife was asking me like the first night when I got back. She said, well, how was the conference? You know, did you find any new clients? You got any new leads or anything like that? And I did actually. I've, I've got a couple of nice leads, some interesting opportunities that are that are bubbling up. But I said the primary thing that I got out of it was I spent a tremendous amount of time with my best friend, Josh Shirley. He was my original co-host on this show, of course. He was my co-host from the very first podcast I started, Two Guys, One Pod. Uh, and again, my literally my best friend in life. He and I don't get to see each other that often, even though he lives across town. We spent you know, five days together or whatever it was. Corey Finneran. We went down there and stayed in an Airbnb with Corey Finneran, the host of the Ivy Envy podcast, another one of my – probably my best friend in, in podcasting specifically. And any time you spend with somebody like that in person, it just like re-solidifies and deepens your relationship. I mean that's one thing that Jay, you and I have talked about. The fact that we get to connect in this way every couple of – you know, every six months or so, every uh, year at least um, – touch base and you're reminded like, boy, if we lived across town for each other, if we shared a complex, like our kids would be best friends, wouldn't we? Um, those distant relationships um, in person uh, 
it is incredibly important. So anytime anybody asks me, what is the key? What is, what is it that you get out of a podcasting conference or any industry conference, by the way, remember last week we were talking about staying in your lane, Jay, and worrying about your niche, not necessarily podcasting, but maybe it's, you know, the, the fan, uh, area that you podcast about or the industry that you podcast about or the industry that your business is in the trivia world, like Jonathan Oaks, when you go to those conferences too, it's about the relationships you build. It's about the friends that you make. It's about the connections. And yes, part of that is transactional, right? You meet people that do different things than you do. And when that comes up that you need a guy or a girl for X or for Y, you go, Hey, I know, I know Jessica Kupferman that does this, and I know uh, Josh Elledge that uh, gets you media promotion, and I know, you know, Jessica Rhodes that uh, helps with uh, this thing, and I know uh, this person over here that has this focus. Okay, somebody says they're starting their podcast about a new TV show or something. Who's the expert on that? I immediately go, hey, talk to Troy Heinrichs. He did a show about the blacklist and ended up on the DVDs. Right in the special features. Talk to talk to Troy Heinrichs again. He launched a Beyond Westworld podcast and Facebook group, and they went to like fifteen thousand, twenty thousand members in the first year. You know, like that's that's somebody that has expertise in the field that you're, and that's a friendship that I have that I can hook you up with. So yes, some of it is transactional. Some of it will end up with dollars in your pocket, but more than that, it will enrich your life. You know, like that's, that's the big thing that I tell people about podcasting. You you are probably not going to get rich. Jay and I are good testaments to that, but it will tremendously enrich your life. Um, no matter what the outcomes are dollar wise. And that's the kind of thing that you can grow and expand at an event like PodFest. And that said, if you are a beginner or intermediate podcaster, these sessions usually are very good and very informational. The problem you'll run into is you have to know which of those sessions are the ones that are giving you the right information and leading you uh, down the right path. Now, that said, for me, I do like to go to a couple of different sessions every now and then, uh, but I definitely try and make time for the keynotes. Did you see any of the keynotes uh, and, and what were they based on? So so it was it was some of the same names that you regularly get. John Lee Dumas had a, a pretty good one. I saw some of his. I saw a little tiny portion of Pat Flynn's. I like, but again, I feel like I've heard their message on a regular basis yeah. and they have a, a, a similar message. The message, the tone is the same anyway. Sometimes the uh, specific uh, imagery or metaphor is different, but the the way the di- the direction they're driving has always been consistent, and that's a good thing. But that's one of the reasons why they built such large audiences, right? I, I so I didn't. I can't speak to the keynote specifically. You're right, and here's how I here's the other thing that I always tell people: if you're going to go to the conference, you need to buy the package that includes the virtual ticket, right? You yes. need access to the recordings after the fact. First of all, they're going to be much higher quality than anything you could try to take yourself or notes that you could take in the sessions. And again. If you know that you have the recordings coming, you don't have to worry about picking that wrong. Hey, there's two about audio editing, and I don't know either one of these people's names. Which one should I choose? It doesn't matter. If you pick the wrong one, you can watch the other one after the fact. Or again, if you meet somebody in the hallway and they're like, hey, where are you going? And you're like, well, I was headed to this session, but... I really want to continue this conversation. You can continue the conversation, you know, go sit and have lunch together or or sit there in the lobby and, and talk about your specific shows and the ways that you can collaborate or the different lessons you can learn from each other and then watch the session after the fact. That is the reason the virtual ticket is there. It is not uh, just an upsell. It is not just a way to capture more <laughs> of your money. I know it feels that way. So listen, as a guy, as a penny pincher who has gone to these things before, I understand how that feels making that decision on whether or not you want the virtual ticket. But you want the virtual ticket. Honestly, I think sometimes there is more to be gained from getting the virtual ticket only and staying near the conference and like wandering <laughs> around the lobby. And don't tell anybody I said that. But so I mean, what I, were the, I, honestly you could piece you could piece together the best parts of the conference i feel like uh in, in some ways that's not the cheapest way to do it but it's not the easiest way to do it but but yes the that's that's the way to do it and then it doesn't matter right whether you're beginner or intermediate you can watch those sessions jay i've st- i've got access today to every podcast movement I've ever been to, and I think all the PodFests, too. I think I've got virtual tickets for every PodFest I've been to as well. And there's not a lot in those sessions that I would go back to now three, four, five years later. 
But there's some of them are, particularly some of the big, the keynotes, as you mentioned, like there are things from Kevin Smith's uh, keynote when I saw him in Chicago or Roman Mars when I saw him in Fort Worth or Sarah Koenig when I saw her at the end in Fort Worth. There are moments from all of those people that were very inspirational. And sometimes when I'm trying to make the point to somebody else, like I'm like, well, let me just go back to the source. Where was that? What did she, how did they put it? You know, they had exactly the right thing to say, because when you bring in those Again, it's not just the expert voices. It's not just the celebrity names. It's people who have had success, right? They have proven themselves in the market and the industry. So the things that they say bear more weight. If it's the same idea that I'm telling you anyway, but I haven't succeeded on Roman Mars's scale. So when I can use him as an example, that really drives it home to a client. I always misquote Roman Mars from that keynote, too, because he said something about uh, creativity is 99 percent stolen and one percent unique idea uh, or something along those lines. I always I always misquote it. I always misquote it. So I I, I would love to actually go and find that quote and write it down so I could I could remember it properly. But you mentioned before, you know, you could go and you could hang out in the lobby and can sort of piece together what the conference has been all about. So what were the whispers in the hallways? What were what were the main themes uh, out of this particular conference? It's, it's interesting. You talked the other day, you know, about uh, Dave Jackson and his his new takeaway about everybody's talking about seasons. Everybody's talking about um, uh, monetization. Everybody's talking about funding, uh, which are new things. I did hear, actually, uh, several people talking about funding in different ways. I uh, heard some interesting talk about grants, which I hadn't really heard before at a, at a large level. I mean, I've heard individual podcasters talk about that, but that was like a hubbub about people talking about grants, local grants, state grants, state grants, and, and so forth, organizational grants. Um, the, the other big takeaway was there was a tremendous focus this year on video. Uh, that happened a little bit last mm. year. You and I remember there was like the one day sort of a pre-event uh, where they focused on YouTube. Well, that happened again this year. But that was better attended, and there were uh, it seemed like more YouTube creators with a little status and um, experience already. Whereas last year, it seemed like there were a couple of those folks, and then a lot of people that were interested in getting into YouTube. This year, there were a lot of YouTube creators, and also a lot of people that were interested in getting into it. And I heard a lot of interest from the podcasters about what can we do? Is it just audiograms on YouTube? Do we need to be doing? you know, some sort of video adaptation snippets. What, how can we better use YouTube to uh, help build and, and grow our brand as well instead of like working against ourselves? That was something that I heard quite a bit of too. And then you mentioned too the number of companies that, that it seemed like were in attendance it had, has grown significantly. The trade floor was large this year. It was larger than last year. Absolutely. And, um, looks like I, I again we're going to go all the way next year to a larger venue i would not be surprised to see that expand by another quarter or so if not more um there were a lot of new faces uh, as far as companies and and brands a couple that i didn't actually know that i had not heard of or seen of uh, seen from before um potatize was one in particular that i've is on my list to do a little bit of research for i said hi to one of the uh, the trades people i didn't want to get into the full hard sell so i i grabbed a sticker and bounced out but um yeah, it, it was very interesting to see, um, again, all the familiar faces were there, your Libsyn, your Rebel Base Media and, and podcast websites. And uh, Todd Cochran was there with Blueberry. Uh, you know, I got to say hi to Dave Jackson and, and to Elsie Escobar. Uh, the uh, the folks from FinCon were there. They've been there for a couple of years now. Uh, FinCon, mm-hmm. a financial focused conference for bloggers originally, but now a lot of podcasters and YouTubers are in that space as well. Uh, and they've got a great presence with PodFest, too, and a great um, relationship. Relationship. They were in, funny enough, they were in Orlando last year too. It was like all the conferences went to Orlando over the last little bit. Uh, speaking of all the conferences, I saw a great post from uh, Danny Pena on mm-hmm. Facebook that I want to mention here real quick. And I'm going to quote him directly. I'm going to pull this up so that I don't get it wrong. Um, but he, Danny was not able to make it. Danny is the host of Gamer Tag Radio or one of the hosts of Gamer Tag Radio. And uh, he had co- very concise thoughts that I thought summed this up perfectly. I just heard that over a thousand people attended PodFest Multimedia Expo 2019 in Orlando, Florida. Congrats to my friends Chris Kermitzos and John Dennis. The more events we have like this for podcasters, the better it is for all of us. By the way, 
to tell you the truth, I could care less about competition between Podcast Movement, PodFest, and other podcast events. PodCon's going on now in Seattle, has a whole different sort of take on this thing. Our industry is never going to grow if we don't support each other. The next conference is PM19 in Orlando, Florida. I hope to see you all there. Can't wait. Hashtag podcasting. Uh, and I absolutely agree with that. Danny is spot on. I don't care about any competition and I've heard some rumbles about that, but that's nonsense. Uh, th- there is room for everybody. And isn't it nice that we have the option in this industry a couple of times a year to basically catch all of our podcasting buddies, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, I mean, like Jay, for instance, you very specifically didn't have a chance for a lot of reasons, uh, family obligations and stuff to make it down to Orlando right now. Maybe you will in, in August, you know, that'll be another, sw- another bite at the apple. You won't have to wait a whole year to have that chance. Likewise, if you get to go to all these things, you know, if you, if you are like me, you're in the industry and like generally it's like, it's more likely than not that you're going to be at uh, this, these events. Then you get to see your buddies every six months instead of, you know, every year. Um, <laughs> I want, I want more of these. Again, one of the big things we're going to be talking about for the rest of this episode, Jay, is uh, the continued new money that can come and should come and will come eventually into this space. Uh, podcast conferences is one avenue. When you show these large corporations, mic corporations, I talked to this guy from, um, I think, sure, maybe he was with Focus, right? He was with one of the mic companies, though, and they're just launching their own podcast. And the reason is, as a company, they see, hey, <laughs> we're selling hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands of dollars, millions of dollars this year, tens of millions of dollars this year, maybe, of gear directly into the podcasting space. Who are these people? Why do they like us? How could we make them like us more? Feel like some of our competition is ahead of us. Uh, so podcasting conferences is the place where those companies can see you directly, where you can speak directly to them about what sort of services, what sort of products, what sort of hardware, what sort of software you would like to see, the changes you would like to be made. Man, that right there is worth the ticket, right, Jay? (laughs) To get in front of a supplier and to say, I like your mic, but the (laughs) mute switch makes too much hand noise. Right. So I can't use it here. How can we change that in the next model? And I would gladly pay $90 instead of 75 for a premium version of that or something, right? Make the podcaster pro version where the mute switch is, <laughs> is actually mute uh, or whatever. You know what I mean? Like simple things like that. So again, software, my, my app of choice for editing is Ferrite. It's, it's a one-man developer team. I doubt I'm ever going to see him at a podcasting conference. But I have specifically tagged him several times and said, I wish you would come. First and foremost, because he would be able to expose his company and his app directly to so many more podcasters than I can just by proselytizing it from my little corner. But also, he could hear directly from other podcasters that have maybe looked at it before and said, ah, it's not for me. Why? What is what is the hang up that you open it up and you say, no, nah, it's too complex. I can't do that. So, again, if you're a company and you're sort of serving this space, you need to get that uh, booth. You need to get in. You need to get that support for these conferences and you need to make it happen. I think a company that has done a great job of that is Hindenburg. Uh, speaking of audio editors, they have made their presence felt at these conferences and they have learned from the podcasters exactly what they uh, can do to improve on their product. I personally love Hindenburg and I have uh, their um, their journalist version, uh, but I don't use it often. That's just because as an audio editor, I grew up on the audition suite. It was previously Cool Edit Pro and became Audition. And you end up learning what you love. I can edit on Audition in like 2.2 seconds. It would take me about two to three times that on Hindenburg just because I got to relearn everything. I've got to take two steps back to go forward to move to another platform. I'm just not ready to make that two steps back yet to relearn a, a different program. But that's how I always explain things to new podcasters. They ask, well, what editor should I use? I tell them whatever one you end up using is going to be the one that you love and the one that you're going to stay on. So if you end up using, for instance, Audacity, which is a free editing program, you're probably not going to move off of that to something else because you're going to have to take that two steps back to relearn a different audit, uh, a different editor. So do yourself a favor Pick an editor that you feel fits your skills 
the best. And quite honestly, Hindenburg is very easy. It does a lot of the things that you need to do for a podcast automatically, or, or as the kids like to say, automatically, which I, which I think is a much more fun word to say. Uh, you just literally throw everything in and automatically the levels are all equal to each other. It's just... It's an amazing product. Anyway, that was another free commercial. Since you're throwing out free commercials, I figured I'd throw out a free one too, and and I'm not even getting paid for it. Yeah, we're, see, where are, where are the sponsorships, folks? Speaking of uh, <laughs> of of uh, bringing those relationships into the podcast space, uh, always listening pod at gmail dot com to contact Jay and I <laughs> for sponsorship opportunities. Hey, but seriously, if if you're if you're a company. Call Chris Grimitzos over the next couple of days. You know, get get in line for for Podfest 2020. Uh, talk to Jared Easley and and Dan Franks and that crew at Podcast Movement because I guarantee you there are still a couple of slots available for sponsorship in some form or, or another at Podcast Movement this summer. Um, Jay, I think it goes the other way up- too. It goes the other way too because NAB which is the big the, the big conference for national broadcasters, it's the National Association of Broadcasters, is also starting to embrace podcasting. And there's going to be a very large podcasting presence at the NAB, which is in April, I believe. So it's not even a month away uh, from this point. Uh, and there's also the RAIN conferences. These tend to be... Um, geared more towards uh, the higher end, the corporation side of podcasting, but independent podcasters can learn quite a bit. I've I've said this from the very beginning. I, I think I actually did a panel once. What could independent podcasters learn from corporate podcasters? And there is a lot to learn from both sides. The corporate side can learn a lot from the independents, and the independents can learn a lot from the corporate. So don't just ignore the higher-end conferences either because they're just as important. Absolutely. Uh, Jay, while I was headed to PodFest, and, and just real quick, I do want to say thank you to those two guys, especially Corey Finner and, and to Josh Shirley for giving me a great week. I, I'm totally refilled on guy time and, and uh, relationships and, and everything. Got to say hello to almost everybody that I love in the podcasting space, which is really fun. Hug a bunch of necks. And Jay, here I am. I'm like four days out back now, and I don't have the conference crud. No cold in my head. Oh, so you're, l- you're lucky. That's what I'm saying. I was in and out. I made it. I made it. Uh, I didn't get to go. The one thing that I'm very, very sad about, I had to leave early because uh, just our travel arrangements were, were set up that way. But I didn't get to go to the uh, the roast of John Lee Dumas. They, this is two years in a row now that they've done a roast to end the PodFest festivities. And so Saturday night they did this roast. Uh, I am very sad that I didn't get to make it. Can't wait for the video on that one. I'm imagining it was very, very good. Um, while I was headed down to Florida, though, the event – effectively for podcasting happened <laughs> before the event for podcasting. Uh, we're talking about the infinite dial, of course, from Edison research. Um, Jay, if there is a, you know, Nielsen of podcasting for right now, right. this is it. This is as close as we get. And once a year we get this great update. Uh, they, they do excellent research, not just in the podcasting space across the media world for lots of different agencies. And if you want the nuts and bolts uh, as a big corporation, you can go in and buy the full version of this, um, report and get some really specific demographic info. The, high points they share and in particular what we're going to focus on is the podcasting part of it jay but but talk me through and not just me but our listeners as well talk me through the important part because i know most of us have seen this video maybe but even when you're watching it you're like okay what do all those numbers mean well i i wrote down a full page of notes from watching this and i'm going to try and and crank through as much of the notes that i have here as possible and i'm going to go chronologically as it was presented in the presentation from Tom Webster and oh my gosh, I'm always going to forget the other guy. It's uh, cause, cause I'm in love with Tom Webster. I've got a bromance with Tom Webster. I think he knows it. If he doesn't, you know, we've talked about ha- perhaps having guests on the show. I think our first guest should absolutely be Tom Webster. But in any case, <clears throat> uh, the Ed- Edison research folks do a wonderful job, uh, in providing us all this information and they do numerous presentations all throughout the year they they are planning on presenting a podcast centric uh report a little bit later on this year so you can go to edisonresearch.com you can sign up for that and get notifications as to when these presentations come you can also follow tom webster on facebook and on twitter he is all obviously very good at marketing uh these reports that he is in uh mostly in charge of and i want to start here with 
the social media. Now, they've presented the infinite dial since 2006, I believe. Um, they may have actually presented the infinite dial longer than that, but 2006, I think, is when he said they started tracking podcasting. So they are one of the longest running uh, research firms when it comes to getting any sort of data regarding people and listening to podcasts. So they start with social media. And what we see in the social media right now is the precipitous drop of people from Facebook. People are not using Facebook as much as they used to be. Um, in terms of total U.S. population 12 plus, uh, just three years ago, Facebook was at 67%. It's now down to 61 Now, you're like, well, that's real. That's only six points, Jay. You know what? What's the big deal? I, I've been seeing these tweets from Tom, and I love it. It's a great way to put it. Imagine if tomorrow the states of Pennsylvania and New Mexico disappeared. That's what Facebook saw in a year, not not in three years. In in a year, they they lost the entire state of Pennsylvania and New Mexico. Uh, so it's a significant number of people. And when you're talking about a platform that is monetizing itself through advertising, that's a huge, huge chunk of money uh, that is missing. By the way, Twitter uh, in the last three years has dropped from 23% to 19 Uh That is a major, major drop. And I, I noted, where the heck are all these people going? Uh, because when it comes to uh, platform growth, the only one that showed significant growth is Instagram. Instagram has gone up from 34 to 39%. I believe this is presented in percentages. Uh, yes. But in any case, uh, the kids are all on Instagram these days. They're also on Snapchat. Snapchat remained flat at 31. They now included WhatsApp, uh, which is at 18. But, um, you know, the kids, the millennials... Those they're not using Twitter and Facebook anymore. So when it comes to marketing your podcast and knowing who your avatar is, what your group is, if your show is specifically designed for a younger crowd, you don't want to be marketing your show on Facebook and Twitter. You want to be marketing your show on Instagram, Snapchat, WhatsApp. You got to be where your audience is. And that's something I think that is key to note. Now, what I would love is to talk to Tom Webster about where the sports people are. Now, I happen to know that, and I don't have any solid data, that a lot of sports people are on Twitter. So while the usage on Twitter may be dropping overall, I don't believe that's true for sports as a genre. So that's what I would love to see a, a further breakdown on. I don't know if we'll ever get that or if I have to pay to get that sort of information. My guess is I'd have to pay for it. Well, my question, Jay, long term there is, does the Instagram usage drop as well, right? Because everybody knows Instagram's owned by Facebook. If you're feeding the Instagram algorithm, you're feeding the Facebook algorithm. If any, or even, you know, a t significant portion at all of that drop. And it's like 15 million raw people, I think, or something a little bit more than that, that, that left Facebook uh, just in America over one year. If any of that is about their current scandals, the privacy issues, the, the ongoing ad tracking, just the, uh, again, like Facebook doesn't seem like a well-run company at the top. And if that is your opinion, if you've left Facebook for any of those reasons, there's n very little argument for you to stay on Instagram, right? So I wonder if that's not a trailing factor. People left Facebook first because they put it more in your face and they'll leave Instagram second because, again, the same nagging issues they had that made them leave Facebook will make them leave uh, Instagram as well. Well, there's a great slide a little bit later on in the infinite dial about social brand used most often by age 12 to 34. Uh, in 2015, Facebook was 58% of that usage. In 2019, it's down to 29%. Uh, Instagram uh, up to 26. So you can take those two. They almost equal what Facebook used to be in 2015. It's Snapchat uh, that grew the most over that time from 9% to 28%. Wow. Wow. That is something. It really is. And it, I, it shows me that the market is currently ripe for, um, you know, interruption. And uh, uh, there there is an opportunity for a new social media, um, you know, 
website or, or service of some sort. I don't know what that would look like. I, there's been a lot of rumors in the Apple camp for years that they might try to turn their iPhoto sharing into some sort of social network, particularly because of their ongoing sort of issues with Facebook as Facebook now uh, fully owns Instagram and has for years. But I don't, I don't know. I don't see that really happening. Um, I would like to see an alternative. Well, the other thing, Joel, is none of these apps are very helpful when it comes to sharing audio. No. Uh, I, and it's and Facebook extremely has it. difficult. Yeah. It's extremely difficult to share any sort of audio on any of these platforms. And when you're trying to drive people to listen to your podcast, one, you're driving them off of their platform, uh, which is mainly the main reason why they don't want to allow you to share your audio. But, I mean, that would be the thing. If I were Facebook, perhaps I start embracing uh, those types of people. Hey, you can listen to your podcasts whilst you're still going through everybody on Facebook. Maybe that helps bring the number back up. To me, if I'm a struggling company, I look towards the audio space as something that could perhaps help me. The takeaway for me, Jay, if you're a regular podcaster listening to this and you say, but what does it mean? It's another reinforcement. You need your website, right? You need that dot com. Then you can right. direct that. Even if you don't actually build a web platform, fine. You don't have your own web full website. You can take your domain and redirect it to your media host's version of a website. You know, Libsyn offers a pretty good website. Spreaker, I think, has a basic website that you could use if you wanted to and redirect the domain there. There's lots of ways to do it, but get the domain first and be driving people to that because then it won't matter what Facebook does in a year or two, or Hey, look, president, uh, Elizabeth Warren comes in in a couple of years. She's going to bust Facebook in two or three parts. Right. So then <laughs> none of this will matter, but you will already be, you will already be nimbly prepared by driving people to your website for whatever comes again. Website. Joel, you've com. committed the you've committed the two major crimes in any sort of media. politics you religion. Baby. God and politics in this particular show. How I'm not you? saying I'm voting for President <laughs> Warren. I'm just saying when she becomes president and busts up Facebook and Twitter, we will all be prepared as nimble podcasters. <laughs> uh, moving now to smartphones. Yes. Uh, we know is where most people listen to their podcasts these yeah. days is on a smartphone. Uh, smartphone ownership has remained fairly flat over the last three years. In 2017, uh, 81, um, let's see here, I think 81% of U.S. Americans, <laughs> U.S. Americans <laughs> uh, owned a smartphone. We're now at 84. Uh, last year it was at 83. So smartphone growth has really remained flat. And quite honestly, it's like, well, what new features are coming on smartphones? There's nothing outstanding. I'll keep my old smartphone. But beyond that, I, it, we've pretty much reached the saturation point, I think, for smartphone ownership. I don't think it's going to get that much larger from this it's, point on. That's pretty close to a one-to-one -one penetration on adults though right like i mean it's it's not there there is clearly a segment of the audience that either is uh, uh price sensitive in a way that is unable to get into the smartphone market still or that for whatever reason uh you know in their life does not want a smartphone still i think about seniors you know a lot of seniors use that they just want the flip phone they don't want any features they don't want a screen they want a battery life that lasts for a week et cetera, et cetera. so there there are people that can afford it that make that choice then there's another segment of the audience that literally cannot afford a smartphone and the plan that it comes with um but if you take those away and children who parents don't generally give smartphones to that 80 million plus number gets real close to everything that's addressable in the united states that's why when you hear the talk about like uh maximum iphone or peak iphone or whatever that's what they mean jay like the total number of people in the world that you can sell a smartphone to We've basically got it. Everybody knows that they're available. There's nobody wandering around the, the mall and goes, what is that when they wander past the AT&T <laughs> right. store, right? Okay. Well, it's funny you bring that up because we're going to get to a piece of media that I think is – a, a very interesting and curious um, tablets. I'm not really going to talk about much about tablets, but that too has been pretty much flat since 2015. Although 2015 was 49%, 2019 we're at 56%, but 2016 was 51, then 53, then 50, and now 56. Tablet ownership has pretty much remained uh, flat. Although a big jump between last year and this year, my guess is uh, there was a new tablet that came out this year. 
that was Android affordable. Still, Android still has not really penetrated this market, although Google's trying again with the – they've basically moved on to the Chrome OS instead of the Android OS for the tablet size. That's really interesting. Microsoft's constantly doing new things in the space. They just don't sell a ton of them. Uh, but Apple did release both a new low-cost tablet and a new top-end tablet with the iPad Pro. So that, yes, the, the market took a little jump just because there was some new interesting hardware there. This is the piece of media that we're going to spend a little bit of time on. Uh, Smart speakers uh, jumped from 18 to 23 percent. Estimated 65 million Americans own a smart speaker. Uh, Although I say uh, own a smart speaker, a majority of people, uh, one in five, own a smart speaker at this particular point in time. And the average number of smart speakers in the household is uh, three. Uh, and I'm like, what are people doing with all these smart speakers? Like, wh- why do I need more than one smart speaker in my home? So I'll t- I'll tell you because I'm that guy, right? I have I personally have three dedicated devices that are that are smart speakers. I have a Amazon the Dot in my office here. I have an Amazon dot downstairs in the living room that connects to our home stereo. And then I have the Amazon fire cube. Uh, that's not what they call it. I it's the little box. It does 4k, but it also has the echo basically built into it. So you can talk to her directly. She's got, uh, IR relays all over the box. So I can tell it to control, like I can tell it to turn on the TV. I can tell it to turn the volume up, uh, it, all those things. But the problem, Jay, is once you begin to add smart home elements. So let's say you put in like lights, smart home lights. You need the activation device in multiple places in your home so that mm. your kids can use it and your wife can use it and you can use it. Like you can't walk into your kid's room to turn on the smart light, but have to holler downstairs to the echo that's in front of the living room. Sometimes they can hear you if you, if you call, I mean, the speakers are, I mean, the microphones are very good, but you want multiple. If you get into the ecosystem at all, you very quickly want multiple devices. In fact, what ends up happening is you want one in every room because then you're mm. like, I want to play music and I want it to follow me. You know, I want, I want to be able to speak from this. You use the intercom system. Like we do that all the time. We'll be downstairs and buzz our daughters in their bedroom. They can hear my office one, uh, through the closet, (laughs) through the closet door. (laughs) They can hear the office uh, echo go off or it comes over my speakers. And, uh, yeah, I mean, they're again, the same thing with the, um, HomePod, they're just more expensive. The the Apple version of this, I know lots of people who've bought one as like a trial. They're like, oh, I got it on sale for two fifty or whatever, and I, I gave it a try. The sound was really, really good, but then they keep hearing other people talking about the stereo pairing and how if you put two of them together, it really blows away even a top end stereo system in some ways. And so they they pony up, they buy another one, and then all of a sudden they got two, and they're like, oh, we need one in the bedroom too, and I need one in the upstairs in the office, and I need one for outside, you know, on the patio or whatever. See, I unfortunately live in a very small home. It's one floor, and Lexi can hear me all the way in the living room from here in the bedroom. So, um, yeah. Uh, they also mentioned that old people appear to be buying a lot of the smart speakers. So uh, my guess is probably the the lights thing. They no longer have to clap on, clap off uh, for their lights. They can just tell Lexi to turn the lights on and off. So I have begged my mom to do this for my dad. My dad has problems with the remote, and he has ever since we moved to like digital cable, right? As when we went from more than 40 channels, he can't. if you can't just click through all of them, he has a real problem with it. And I've told her, I'm like, if we get one of these fire cubes like what i have he can just literally say out loud turn the tv onto the outdoor channel turn you know put the tv on wildlife channel put the tv on you know the western channel and it would set it would do it all for him she thinks that he would get confused and not want to like he would end up not speaking out loud and get more frustrated even by not having the remote and so we we haven't pulled that trigger for him but yes that's that was exactly the thing that i thought of is i was like what a how much could this help you know, our, our senior, our moms and our dads and our grandparents that are, that are out there sort of like in those later years in life. Well, I mean, in my mom, my mom and dad got a long, long life. I don't mean to say it like that, but you know what I mean, Jay, like right. they're, they're done with it. They don't want to bend over and find the switch for the stand up lamp in the living room anymore. You know, the, uh, so, so that brings us to monthly online audio listening. Now online audio is described as basically anything that is streamed 
or downloaded on the internet. Um, that, and that can include an online stream of a local radio station, for instance. Uh, online listening, online audio listening is up, and it does appear that there's a lot more older people listening to online audio listening. Uh, there was an increase from in the millennials. The 12 to 24s went from 88 to 91. The 25 to 54s went from 73 to 74. I mean, our group, Gen X, has pretty much remained consistent about embracing online audio and things of the internet. Uh, the age 55 plus went from 33 to 40. Uh, older people are buying more smart speakers. They're now listening to more online audio what online audio are they listening to? There appears to be more audiobook listening uh, occurring this year in terms of what is what saw a major increase in online audio listening. Uh, and the average time spent listening to online audio also increased. Uh, and that would mean more audiobooks. Uh, audiobooks tend to be a longer format audio. Uh, so all of this... Uh, is making sense. And I'm sure you're super excited to hear uh, this uh, being a person who does a lot of audiobooks for a living. Well, the other thing that, and I didn't think about this, but uh, Josh Shirley actually pointed out to me when, when we were listening to it live, he goes, that makes perfect sense. Cause who do you know that advertises more on podcasts than audible? And I mean, honestly, right. outside of maybe Squarespace or Stamps.com, Audible is on a tremendous amount of podcasts. And I think if you've talked to any of their recent uh, CEOs, and they've had a little bit of turnover there in their executive team, but if you talk to any of the folks that have headed their division, they will tell you podcasting has been a huge growth area for them because they already know those people like Long-form audio content, Jay. And uh, mm. here's the other thing. It, it's an interesting sort of duology. As those two things grow, the difference, of course, being you can't advertise in that audiobook space. You can't advertise in my podcast, though. Right. So online audio listening in the car has obviously grown. AM, FM radio is still number one as an audio source in the car. Uh, audio uh, own digital music and CD players are two and three. Then online radio at 28, podcasts at 26, Sirius XM at 22. Uh, and you can see the growth o over the years. You can see AM, FM radio slowly uh, making a decline. It dipped from 82 the past two years to 81. Online audio has grown and has podcasts. Podcasts went from 19 just three years ago, now up to 26. <clears throat> so a huge jump in podcasting. Interesting to note, uh, the audio source most used in the car, there is a decrease in online audio listening in the car through your cell phone. Dropped by 1%. That they mentioned due to an increase of your in-dash info systems. All these uh, in-dash info systems are being built with podcasts in mind or with uh, some sort of listening platform, perhaps one that begins with an S and ends in a Y, uh, <laughs> being built directly into uh, your car dashboards, um, which is very, very interesting. Your audio brand awareness, uh, Pandora, Still number one at 89, iHeartRadio at 74, Amazon Music uh, now at 74, Apple Music up to 73, and there's that S and Y, Spotify at 71. Uh, Spotify is going to be a major player uh, as we continue to move on. Uh, the audio brands listed two in the last month, Pandora number one at 30, Spotify at number two at 24. Uh, and that is a huge growth over the last three years for Spotify. They went from 18 to 24 in three years. Pandora has gone from 32 to 30. They are actually losing listeners on Pandora. They're moving to Spotify. But who specifically is moving to Spotify? It's the kids. The 12 to 34, they jumped from 37 to 46. Actually, the kids, Spotify is number one as their most used audio brand in the last month. Pandora is uh, at number two at 36. SoundCloud uh, is at 23. So the kids uh, listening to those platforms the most. You know, Jay, one of the I, – I, I mentioned that I got to say hello to almost all my podcasting friends and hug a bunch of necks at PodFest. One of the people I talked to in person was Melvin Rivera, who is at the center of Spanish-language podcasting. I mean, he is – 
uh, going to be uh, if he's not already in their Hall of Fame someday. And uh, one of the things that he and I were talking about is the the current explosion in Spanish language podcasts. He's really doing some exciting stuff. He's got a course, uh, not just a course, but like a whole school that he's working on. But he mentioned what you and I were talking about last week, the Spreaker infographic that showed effectively all of South America, which outside of Brazil is Spanish speaking, right? Basically everybody except Brazil, they speak Portuguese. Um, he says the the entire continent. Yeah, Spotify is the way that they get pod, podcasts. Spotify is the way they get audio. Uh, real quick mention of Spotify. Uh, we don't have time for the full uh, story today, but Jay, they announced it today. Spotify has a deal now. If you're on their nine ninety nine a month plan, you get Hulu for free, my friend. The mm-hmm. five ninety nine plan for Hulu. That's a, a partnership you could already get for like an extra three bucks or something. You you could save a couple of dollars a month, but now it's just free. Spotify is the place for audio as far as that younger demographic goes. And so it's going to take Apple or somebody else swinging big to win that back. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because we get to the podcast listening now. Seven in 10 people in the United States now say that they're familiar with the term podcasting. That doesn't mean that they're listening, but they're aware of the term. They've heard the term. It also doesn't mean that they know what a podcast is, but seven in 10 people have heard the word podcasting and are familiar with that particular term. 51% of Americans say they have listened to a podcast in the last month. We are now in the majority, or I've listened to a podcast ever. I'm sorry. So 51% of the United States have listened to a podcast ever. We're now in the majority. We're a majority media. Yay. Hooray. Uh, 32% of people said they listened to at least one podcast in the last month. Uh, So that is also a big increase. Uh, Really where we saw the biggest increase in podcast listening were the kids, 12 to 24. They went from 30% uh, 30 listening monthly to 40% listening monthly. And where are these kids listening to their podcasts? What has grown the most, especially with the kids? It's Spotify. Now, Tom sort of stopped short in saying that this was a direct relation. Spotify's increase in brand awareness and increase in usage had to do with podcasting and vice versa. But there's definitely some sort of link between the two that the kids are listening to more on Spotify and the kids are listening to more podcasts. And what has Spotify got most recently? They've embraced podcasting. Yeah, and and again, why? Because there's money in it, Jay. There is money for them. It's a direct transaction. They can take uh, uh, something they were spending money on, uh, music royalty, and make it something they're making money on, add insertion around uh, podcasting. And in the future, add insertion in the middle of podcasting through the technology that they've gotten now by buying Anchor. The last two major uh, stats from this for podcast, 22% of U.S. Americans say they listen to a podcast a week, and the average number of podcasts that they listen to a week is seven. Now, I asked Tom to qualify that. Does that mean they're listening to seven different podcasts, meaning seven different shows and could be listening to seven different episodes of that show, or are they just listening to seven different episodes? And it's seven different episodes. So they could be, for instance, subscribe to The Daily which comes out five days a week, that's five of their seven podcasts that they listen to during the week. Um, So I just wanted to make note of that particular stat. If there are seven, if the weekly listener, the, the heavy podcast listener, is listening to seven podcasts a week, you have to understand when you do a season, when you give your audience a reason to stop listening to you, to get back into that seven. I mean, that's one podcast a day. Um, To get back into that listening habit, you've got to come up with a real good reason to break into that seven. Um, And and if you've got a show that's, you know, three hours long, like Joe Rogan, or if you've got a show that, you know, and you're not Joe Rogan, by the way, um, the podcast listener is probably not going to pick your show to add to their seven. My biggest takeaway from from all of these numbers, but especially the trajectory of the whole report as you laid it out there, Jay, is that podcasting is a gateway medium, <laughs> right? First of all, <laughs> no one is exposed to podcasting, it seems, that doesn't eventually start listening to something. 
And once you listen to something, you find very quickly that that or the next thing you try is actually quite engaging. And once you have at all the ability and the and the wherewithal to subscribe and to engage with the content on any ongoing basis, you realize that all of this content is very good to you and, in fact, will replace something that you're already doing like it it very quickly eats your time if you again you look at those numbers the progression of who knows about it to who's listened in the last week to who's listened in the last month who listens regularly and then how many you listen to and those continue to go up over time and they're not by small increments they're jumping little little jumps every year as we go that is the inherent addictive nature of our medium it's it's intimate and focused on in a way that no other medium can be at least right now and that's that's what you lean into don't worry about hitting everybody you want to hit your audience but when you hit them you will be one of their favorite things in the world we know from previous research from edison research that uh people who listen to a podcast 85 percent of them listen to all or most of the podcast that they're listening to so they're listening uh, through it. We've been teasing forever, it feels, the the money tree uh, that we said that Apple could plant. And uh, using these numbers, uh, I've given I've come up with the base number that uh, podcasting uh, should be uh, based on in terms of the amount of money that's earned in this particular spot via advertising. Using that Apple Podcasts currently has 660,000 podcasts uh, in their uh, database. We know that not all of them are active, but we're just going to use that number um, just as just as a base number. We know that 62 million people listen to a podcast weekly. We know that uh, they are listening to seven shows weekly, and we know that 90 million people are listening to a show monthly. The base number that Apple could could create in terms of revenue on a monthly basis uh, using uh, programmatic advertising, uh, which admittedly has very low CPMs, is $11,718,000 a month. Uh, by the way, this also does not include the the fact that Apple doesn't obviously own a hundred percent of those listens. Um, so you so you can continue to do math off of that. But that is the base number that podcasting should be working off of. Uh, just for fun, <laughs> put in the CPMs for one live read based on the on all those numbers, and it uh, it's a ridiculous number that would never be attained, and that's uh, fifteen trillion. One hundred twenty-four billion thirty-two million dollars a month uh, for one live read uh, for all those podcasts um, in the year three thousand. <laughs> in the year three thousand, um, yeah. When we've eaten radio, right? When when uh, when iHeart Apple Podcasts is our corporate overlord and owns all of uh, the audio space, uh, yeah, that's when we'll make thirteen trillion a month. <laughs> And again, using using very simplistic math, knowing that there aren't 660,000 active podcasts, knowing that there's a lot more uh, episodes that those <clears throat> 62 million are listening to than just one episode or even just seven, uh, the median amount that a podcaster should be earning a month is 10. Every single podcaster should be earning at least $10 a month uh, based on uh, – these numbers. So just something to, to chew on something that that's the money tree that Apple could be planting. And it's the one that I believe Spotify is planting as we speak. And we'll see within the next year. That is a prediction that is not based on any sort of knowledge I have. That's just based off of the information we know of what they have done over the past month or so in their acquisitions of Gimlet and anchor. Well, I'll say this, Jay, I have been podcasting since 2012, and for the past two or three years or so, I have always made $10 a month 
thanks to dynamic ad insertion, and I didn't need to wait on uh, Apple to do that. I also uh, have covered my hosting fees. Look, there are ways out there. There are ways to do this. There are ways already in the industry. We wish, Jay and I have talked for several years, we wish that the industry would align in a, in a fashion that would enable this to grow faster. Uh, the varied marketplaces that are all selling against each other, complicated and lower CPMs, that if we could ever get to the quote unquote sort of ad sense of podcasting, if there was one marketplace working for this, then those CPMs would drift up over time as opposed to down. I'm hopeful we might get there. I think Spotify is about to give it the old college try. Yep. I think very much that's exactly what's going to happen. And knowing that listening is growing there with the youngest demographic, uh, things are only going to look up uh, from that point. And obviously, this is very rudimentary math. You could do much more complex math with this and get a much more accurate number. But uh, that is uh, (laughs) – it's a very interesting number, uh, at least from my perspective, uh, and and one that I think other companies should be paying very, very close attention to. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And uh, in general, your your takeaway from this, Jay – I mean, for me, it was positive, right? We're in the right space. Oh, yeah. We, the bets we've made in this industry are paying off. Uh, it, it, you know, we, we only see in these small little time increments, these research reports give us a slightly larger swath for us to sort of compare ourselves against. But like, we're still in the dawn of this industry, absolutely, but we are growing. Everybody's looking for hockey stick growth that may not get there, but this year we took a significant turn, and it shows that there are still technology things that we can change, marketing things we can change, content things we can change, right? Because that's another thing. There was a new right. rush of content into the space in the last year and all sorts of different angles that brought in a new group of listeners as well. Younger listeners jumped in a huge way that they hadn't in years past. Um, and, and that you know that 12 to 24 had been trailing the rest of the market significantly for a while. Not anymore. Uh, and, and the content is the answer. So sitting on the sidelines of this industry – I say it's time to jump in. Yesterday was the time to jump in. Don't wait. No. And if you enjoyed listening to my breakdown of the infinite dial and want to put my information behind your paywall, uh, next fan up at gmail.com. You can reach me on Twitter at the real pod Vader. I'm on Facebook too. facebook.com slash pod Vader page. Uh, easy ways. I'm very much available as a podcasting free agent consultant, uh, if, if that is something that you're looking for. I wish I had been at said PodFest because I'm sure there were plenty of those companies that were looking for a guy like me. Uh, you can find Jay on Twitter. Where? At the real Pod Vader. That's the first place of contact. You can find all of his links in the show notes, too. Uh, you can follow me at The Rogue's Life on Twitter. You can find us all the time, alwayslisteningpod.com. We appreciate everybody. Well, people aren't listening. using Twitter anymore. That's, the, God, that's right. Everybody, maybe, that's gonna, our, maybe that's our problem. I'm going to have to get on Instagram. <laughs> I, hey, listen, I, I, don't, I can't do the Instagram, man. Like That means i got to take – I'm not that good a photographer, Jay. I, 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 post, I post cute pictures for my kids. That's the best I got. I started an Instagram for Next Fan Up, and I've been – experimenting with it and i'm failing miserably and both of my kids were like dad you posted the same thing twice yesterday and i was like that's because there's a story function and i wanted it to be the story but it wasn't the story it was just a post and i wanted it to be one and it became two i don't know what i did wrong there so yeah old man soderberg who's not the old can't figure out how to use Instagram. We, we don't know Instagram, but we know podcasts, folks. Uh, we'll be yes. back here again next week uh, to tell you all about uh, what else is happening in podcasts. We'd love to get your reaction on the infinite dial or any of this stuff. You can email us always listening pod at gmail.com and let us know uh, any questions or concerns that you have about the industry and uh, or the news of the day, including Man, I'm going to go read some more about that Spotify Hulu deal. That I I wanted to jump over to Apple Music, but that might be the uh, that might be the thing <laughs> that gets me in the Spotify world. I don't know. All right, until next week, we've been your hosts, and uh, I'm Joel. I'm Jay, and we are always listening.
Always Listening is a proud member of the Two Guys and a Rogue Network. You can find all our reviews by searching Always Listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, or you can find us anytime at alwayslisteningpod.com or email us at alwayslisteningpod at gmail.com. Our theme song is Enough by Bethany Rayburn. Two guys and a rogue. I'm one guy. I'm the other. And this is The Network.